it was his showcase. Of course, he had his ramrod, which uh, was Moses. But you know, Ro Rockefeller took a lot of personal interest that this thing open on time. We had a lot, if memory serves me. Some of the European uh, 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 villas were not online right away. There was a terrible time. I mean, we were waiting. You know, the State Department was trying to get people to commit from Europe and so forth. That didn't happen right away because the New York State World's Fair, what? What are we going to do there type of thing? So you had industry which pushed in. Then you finally, towards the end, you got a lot of the, uh, you got a lot of the uh, foreign countries uh, coming on board and at the last minute. But this was churning up mud. I mean, it was a terrible time. But you want to know the fact of the matter is, yeah, we all stood in line to go up our own building. It was that great. I mean, what the hell am I doing? I'm 26. I'm looking at this big tower that's going to be in a movie called Men in Black. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. All right. I thought, I thought we had a great time. i got to be honest with you. But make another thing. All of us really, even though we were really going through this whole thing, this, we really all had a good time. We enjoyed each other's company, which I think was really important because you could really, really easily be demoralized by the pressure and everything that was going on. I think we all kind of sort of sustained ourselves. We made jokes about ourselves. We made jokes about Lev Zetlin. We, we, we made jokes met, about Ken. We, all I mean, we really made six, jokes. We all met in 1961, and we're all still very good friends. We see each other five or six times a year. All right. Last but not least, travelers. Um, tell me the, the, the design, where did it come from, and the innovation. There was a lot, obviously, in that. And yeah. Travelers was my project with Jim Chaplin. Uh, Donald Desky was the designer. He was an industrial designer. And Conan Jacobs was the architect, Eli Jacques Kahn, Bob Jacobs, Shelley Fox of Cone, Pedersen, and Fox. And he was there. And uh, basically, the, the, the thing became an umbrella. It's a red umbrella. And it became boomerangs, which are, they, you'll see some drawings around here. And we did all the analysis by hand. We used virtual work. Jim Chaplin was the master of cutting back a structure and making it statically determinate. It was a circular bicycle wheel. Uh, I actually got the whole idea for my PhD thesis while I was working on these projects because it was a bicycle wheel, and let me tell you, the way we analyzed it was archaic. So when I got to the point where I could get a PhD at NYU, my doctoral thesis was the nonlinear analysis of three-dimensional structures. I was the only student at NYU that came up with his own thesis idea. Everybody else extended somebody else's. And it all came because of Zetland, became the bicycle wheel. So. Travelers was wonderful because, number one, it was symmetrical, and it was a boomerang. And if you look at some of the things here, we put equatorial pre-stressing cables around the waist. And the bending moment diagram would have been like this. And by pushing in here, it went like that. It was pretty clever, all done by hand. And if you think about the pressure vessels and circles and boomerangs, I mean, it, it was, we did it by hand, and guess what? We, 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 we were not afraid. We were just doing it. And why were we doing it? Because we could. <laughs> I mean, really. We had big ones. <laughs> well, tell me about the post-tensioning aspect of this, because you, you said, she said this was just, this was just rebar laid down on the, but this was post-tensioned. Was, was the idea to post-tension it there from the beginning? Did you start off saying, let's do it without post-tensioning, uh, and then come to that result? Or? I think Jim Chaplin, Vince, and Lev Zetlin came to me and said, Jim, point, point to the waist there. Point to the W-A-I-S-T. Just right, right, right there. Yeah, right there. So we took these four cables. They were like four-inch diameter bridge strands, structural strand, and we put them in saddles, and we put jacks, and we just jacked. After all of the things were up and it was shored, there were shores obviously holding them, and that just pulled the whole thing together. I mean, it was elegantly simple. And Bethlehem fabricated and erected it. I forget who the general contractor was, probably George A. Fuller. And when Ken mentioned Thompson Starrett, which was the, was the evolver of, of, of Starrett Brothers and Eakin, who actually built the Empire State Building, and George A. Fuller built the Flatiron Building. And if you read all of the books about all these buildings, you'll read about all these characters. And they were still around in 1962, 63. It was, it was really a different world. Um, 
you talked about being, you know, uh, fearless, but uh, you all tell stories about how uh, there was a little bit, uh, Lev behind you was also putting a little bit of the fear of God into you. Frank, you, you have a story that just cracked me up when, I, when you told me, so. I need water for this. <laughs> uh, at one point, we, uh, I realized that, you know, we were having a little difficulty in, in, just, in formalizing the, uh, the analysis of this, this ring, and, and, and Lev had sold this, the concept that, yeah, we can do it with the, you know, the battle axe, Shapes which are you know, horrendous, um, and um, and I went to him this one day and, and told him that you know I'm, I'm having a little difficulty in getting this solution you know, and rather than uh, guiding me on how to solve it, he said, Frank, if anything goes wrong with the New York State Pavilion and there's a failure, I'll sue you. <laughs> I'll take your house away. <laughs> Bam! Solution came right up. <laughs> Marie, would you please stand up and take a bow? You put up with this guy. They almost took his house, or your house. Marie Marino back here. Now, someone else was telling the story about the Dr. Zetlin and when the, 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 as they were lowering the shores and the concrete continued to deflect. Which, uh, which project was that on? Was that? George Pavarini and John Contegni both still alive. George lives in Byram, John's up in Connecticut. I was testifying with them on a case only four or five years ago. And Contegni and, and Pavarini say, they're standing under the roof, and you may have been there, and it keeps coming down. It's creeping. Which, which, it's which pavilion is this? Eastman Kodak. Eastman Kodak. Yep. And Pavarini says to Zetlin, what are you going to do if it doesn't stop? And he reaches in and he pulls out tickets to Argentina. <laughs> <laughs> True story. That was our safety factor. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, let, let's bring it forward now. Um, you know, I've, uh, this has been great. I, I, and and um, I'm as, I, I love talking about that environment. I love talking about how exciting it was. But what about, what can we learn today? And, and look, you know, the, the nostalgia part of it is great. And we know that we can't recreate that environment. You know, we've got a lot of things that actually are good now. There's a lot of good things about OSHA, and there's a lot of good things about some of the rules we have out there. But what are the things today that you think that we can learn that would allow us to, to free up our ability to innovate like we said? We can't recreate that environment that existed for a lot of reasons, as we know. But what are some of the things that you would say we could do that are real-world things we could do so a city like New York could start to get back that, like I said, that innovation uh, energy that we had back in, in that period. You talk, you talk. Well, uh, there are a lot of things being done. You take uh, Gary, my friend here. When I first saw some of the Gary designs of 10, 15 years ago mm -hmm. in his office, I said, what the hell are these things? Who's going to build those? Well, you guys, you designed them and they got built because of, because of the computer But program. they were the exception rather than the rule. I don't, no. mean, the, I don't mean the form. I mean... I'm Every talking. job having something new and innovative and taking to the next step. How do you make it more the rule of how we move forward, raising the bar versus well, doing no. the same? You said construction hasn't changed that much in 50 well, years. Well, it's improved uh, well, here and there, yeah. but it's, it's yeah. still you have to build a foundation look, first, you know. Look, I, I, if I can, okay, I think that we've gone past the Rubicon. What happened is, let's look at what happened at the World's Fair. There are three items I don't think you could ever reproduce. There was no ion cost. There was the desire by everyone, government, private enterprise, to finish this job in two years, and the buildings were of an iconic nature. Now we had that there. Now what do we have now? And please forgive me, but I have to tell you, when we go back to when you were, in, were contracting, every contractor had a structural coordinator, mechanical coordinator, and architectural coordinator in his trailer. Right now, you don't have any of that. Right now, it's almost an adversarial situation. You come up with a good idea, you're blown out of the water. Half the time you're designing, you're doing something great, and the, and the contractor's got the owner's ear. Why? Because he's got the purse strings. The whole situation in our industry, there's plenty of innovation, as you can see with Gary and what you guys do around the world and with everything. I mean, there's a plenty of that. But the actual ingredients that created this innovation are missing. I'll give you an example. After slip forming those 16, 17, 18 columns, I slip formed the building in Milwaukee in 1966. 22 story building in 25 working days. The whole structure was completed using slip forming. 
Have we ever slip formed the building since then? No. Why haven't we? Simply because a contractor puts his money at risk, and if he doesn't do the same thing over and over to ensure that his risk is under, under control, he's not going to move out on that. And I've seen it in a number of different instances. So I'm sorry to say, Tom, I don't think anything that happened in the World's Fair then could really be reproduced. Well, actually, uh, there was one major slip form job, the Marriott, which, right. which was a total disaster. And uh, there's never been, oh, it was. <laughs> and also, it's very expensive. They're still trying to pay for that. Uh, the the well, slip we, forms were, were, were a problem, and uh, it, it, it we, made we, a problem. We did, the West, we did the Western Hotel at Copley Place in Boston, 38-story slip form. Turner, Turner actually self-performed. It was fabulous. Right. We did with George Pavarini in Tampa, the tallest building in Florida. It was slip form. Okay, the problem with slip forming, and I'm really into it right now, is that the engineers have put too goddamn much rebar in, and the iron workers can't keep up with a foot an hour, so that's why gang forming and jump forming starts. Mm -hmm. But let's go back. His project in Wisconsin, okay? Absolutely fabulous. Why did it happen? Who was the owner? The general contractor? It was design build. Design build. Get rid of design bid build, get rid of construction managers, and go back to design build. It's the only way to do it, okay? Design assist, go to Yankee Stadium, design assist on the steel. I'm sorry. We couldn't pour a straight concrete column, but that's not the story. No, that's, that's beside the point, okay? The fact of the matter is, design build is the future of America's construction. That's where it's gonna go. Otherwise, we're gonna keep doing the same old shit. Sorry. Charlie, <laughs> Charlie, design build is not a new concept. It, 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 it's now all over the place. The problem in, in, with those slip forms in, uh, at the Marriott was that they were, went out of, out of plumb and they couldn't get them back. And, and that's the problem. Gang forming, which is now a big deal with DOCA and, and uh, Perry and so on. Uh, my, but, point, my point is not that the whole world should be slip formed. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, my point was that that was something that was rather innovative. It was construction, I understand, but I really respect what goes on there. And it was used, and we saw something. I'm not talking only the core, which is what you're talking about. I was talking about the exterior walls also. When this thing got done, the walls on the exterior, all you had to do was put your windows in. And there was even a thought of putting the windows in the form so they would be poured in. So that's all I am. But, but let me, let that me, doesn't get, you know, the fact that they, somebody had a problem at the Marriott but, doesn't Well, let me ask you something, Frank. You've done, you spent a lot of years on the West Coast, okay? And because I want to, the, the innovation challenge that I see in New York specific is there's things done all over this country, let alone around the world, that have a very hard time making their way into New York City. Um, uh, you know, we, 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 you know, when we, we recently had a job where we, uh, where we had a concrete core and a steel frame going up at the same time in, in, in Times Square, and we wrote it up in our, in our company's uh, newsletter as innovation, and the Chicago guys laughed us, you know, and the Philly guys laughed us out. So you worked a lot in, in California, in a place where you're, you're pouring, you know, pouring concrete with rebar that, you know, you, you, if, you, if a bird can fly out, you know it's not, gonna, it's not gonna work. What is it about New York that is it, the, in which we don't seem to be able to even capture the innovation that happens around the country and around the world and bring it back I know we do it fast. I always we make the joke that we yes we have the two day cycle, but then you have to skim coat it for a week. Um, what is I, it about New York know, that's the barrier? I don't barrier? know if there if there is a difference, uh, Tom. I, I I think that you, you know you're being located here in New York, you 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 see the problems magnified. Each area has its own problems that are very similar. Uh, you know, San Francisco, uh, which is my home base, is a, a uh, construction and engineering-wise is very provincial. You know, don't uh, don't uh, take in new ideas or uh, uh, new concepts because they didn't come from here. You know, they they have to come from from San Francisco to be uh, to be worthwhile. But uh, uh, the the whole thing about the 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 um, the atmosphere during the the World's Fair design construction uh, era, which was only a couple of years really. But remember, and Charlie kind of touched on this before. Remember the, the idea of the World's Fair in New York, which opened in 1964, s germinated in the early 50s, less than 10 years after World War II. 
the people that were involved in the design, and the, the really the prime movers, these are all the, the George Pavarini's, the Leb Zetlin, the, although not in America at the time. These these were guys that had uh, had uh, served in World War II. You know this can do, let's get it done, uh, atmosphere. Uh, the, you know the whole the, the zeitgeist of that time was uh, the, uh, the, the 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 man on the moon project. That's that's where the, the Kodak uh, moon uh, scape got its name. So you know there, there were these uh, things that that were happening that I don't know if, if it, you can recapture it, it, at all because it just was part of that that history. But the environment. If, all right. So we are we're getting towards the end here. I want to leave some time let for. Me, let me for, just comment sure. on on this business about the iron workers about the the concrete cores and the and the steel framing. It's a very, it's a very simple problem. The iron workers would not work under under right. concrete. Period. Uh, that and I have I've been retired for a couple of years, so I'm not sure how it's going. But I was involved in some of those, I call them negotiations. Uh, that's a loose term, but where we were trying to convince the iron workers that they could do this. And that I think one of those jobs in, in um, uh, on Broadway, I think I think the course went up. They weren't slip form. They don't slip form in New York. They gang form, and uh, went up first, and the iron workers followed. But we were very concerned because a lot of the iron workers wouldn't. You know, it depended on the individual uh, 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 guy. I think it worked out well. I'm not the first one. May not have nothing. You always want to be the second. You never want to be the first. But uh, I think I think they're doing that a lot with with these concrete with these uh, high-rise office buildings now. Yeah. So uh, let's just talk about government now and government then. Who approved these for you? What is it, the building department? What did, you had these structures, they've never been done before. Um, it doesn't sound like I had enough time for a peer review, and if you did, who would peer review it? Um, what was the process on all of these? Right. Uh, the Corps of Engineers Colonel uh, hired Purdy and Henderson, a, a, a real old line structural engineering firm, and they did all the plan checks on the World's Fair projects. That's so, how it was done. So was, that, because, was it because this was a state project that you had? Um, yeah, it was just that the, the, the New York City Building Department was sort of bypassed because the, the World's Fair was a separate entity, a, a separate state. Who knows what you want to call it? But it was Purdy and Henderson that did all the plan reviews. Okay. All right. So what I want to do just as a last question for you all to kind of opine on a little bit uh, before we take questions from the audience is, all right, it's been 50 years. We understand it's challenging. There was a lot of unique circumstances that, that brought that innovation, that burst of it. But you've now, you've been in this field for those 50 years. If you could recapture something, I don't mean f fancifully, but I mean if you could change something about the way we do work that you could say could make a huge help in, in allowing people, to, these types of, whether innovative structures or approaches to happen, what do you see as the biggest thing that could change, that is realistically could change, that you could well, incrementally change? I, it, there are two or things. Would, uh, basically, overregulation and liability. Uh, those are the two big issues today that slow things down horribly. As far as the actual design work and construction work, there are always ways it can be picked up. People come up with clever ideas constantly about doing this and doing that. And they're always improving the mousetrap. But those two issues are, are killers. And as uh, yeah, I know a lot of people here, are, I'm sure, are very involved in environmental work. Environmental work is fine where, where, it, is, where it should be, but that's often used as a, as a, what do I say, an excuse to start lawsuits, and that often kills a project. It'll kill a project because it's years. Did you have liability insurance? Did Lev Zetlin's office have liability insurance back then? You're asking me? You no, I'm, yeah, I'm just... Uh, small amounts. Small yeah. Very small. Well, it wasn't even you could never cover... It was Frank Marino's house. <laughs> <laughs> you could never cover some of these things with your liability insurance. Uh, we had to... I know we... At one time we were doing... Is that Lenox Handler? We were doing uh, these uh, antenna on top of buildings. And you remember that. And it, 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 what the hell's the building down on? I think it may be... The, the big office building down on the battery, we, we built a big, uh, 17 watt battery place. a big antenna on the roof, and we brought in by helicopter. And that was one of the last helicopter things, and it was really right near the water. We brought some of those components in by helicopter because it was on the roof. 
we had to get $50 million worth of insurance. And, 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 and in those days, it was not easy. No. And it was very expensive. No, so, right. mm -hmm. you bet. so, but uh, by today, it's... That's oh. probably the single biggest thing. We had, I, I remember that there was a project that we did with the DeSimone office. Uh, we had the, the design, we were the structural engineers for a, it was either a hotel or a casino. And on, on opening day, uh, the pool was not finished. It, it didn't have any water in it, but they had a chain link fence around it. And some guy got drunk and climbed over the fence and dove in a pool with no water, broke his neck. But everybody got sued, including the structural engineer. And uh, you know they they, uh, they we don't just go after we don't paint pool bottoms light blue anymore, okay? <laughs> because when he looked in there, he was drunk and it was blue. That's what he did. Sorry. So Vince, what about you? What if you could? Oh. If there was something you could you could change tomorrow? Sincerely, and I, really, I could go. I, I would say get rid of the construction management concept. The construction management concept absolutely sucks. Once they came in and you have no skin in the game, where you're just sitting there and you're pulling a bunch of guys that you're going to bamboozle about giving you the right number mechanically and everything else, you're gone. We used to get cooperation from the general contracts. You're talking Turner. You're talking Fuller. You're talking all those guys. When they came in and they bid a job for you, they actually told you where you might have made a mistake. They don't do it with, I got 432 RFIs, and I don't even speak Spanish, and I run the Miami office. This is a disaster. <laughs> the truth of the matter is they've destroyed us, that this crap of this RFI and what you're going to do. And I, they come, did you mean 16 foot three? Yes, I meant 16 three. Do you really, really mean 16 three? I mean, come on. So the fact of the matter is we want responsible contractors that have some skin in the game so when they make a mistake, they pay for it. But when they're very successful because they're ingenious, they get the rewards of it, and we become a team again. And I think then the, the question of liability, the question of insurance and everything else, if we stand together, we'll begin to shed that into a marginally acceptable area. It is not marginally acceptable. I got people asking me for 10 and $20 million dollars worth of professional liability insurance. The guy says, well, you know, if your building collapses, it's going to cost more than that. But that's not what the insurance is for. If your building's collapse, shoot me. Let's not fool around. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think I'm done with the topic. Okay. <laughs> Every single contractor that we worked with until 1970, someone, someone said it, had four or five people in the trailer that were doing formwork drawings. They had another four or five people in the trailer that were doing something else. They had all these people that were basically taking the contract documents. And before they did it, the architects, like Harrison Abramovitz, had a team of four or five people on every major job who coordinated every single dimension. Everything was checked. The architect checked it, and then the contractor basically took the drawings and built all the formwork drawings. That's all gone. It just doesn't happen anymore. I may add, the reason it was checked was not to give you an extra. The reason it was checked to avoid any future problems. So it was not adversarial, where I'm going to check and I'm going to send you a bill. Just to complete the picture, it was a totally different atmosphere in those days. All right, so I think you may have convinced us we may not be able to get to back to that moment of innovation. <laughs> but I can say, I don't know about everybody else here, if I could get back to the being working on a job, with a bunch of 20-something year olds and having as much fun as you apparently had on that and to be able to sit back 50 years later and remember it all as fondly and, and with, with, with such enthusiasm as you had, uh, I'll take that over innovation any day. So, um, hold on, Charlie, yes. How many people are involved in the ACE Mentor Program? Okay, a pitch. Oh, no. Hold on, hold on, wait a minute. All the money from the sales of my memoir goes to the Ace Mentor Program. If you order it on Amazon, it's 15 bucks, $10 goes to Ace. You want to read about the World's Fair? It's all in here. You want to read about these characters that are sitting up here? They're all in all here. All the outtakes are in there, yes. <laughs> all right, with that, with that, with that sales pitch, I'd like to thank this uh, illustrious... I just want to say... Hold on, all right, hold on. Yes, no, no, quickly, quickly. Yeah, yeah. 
I'm sorry we couldn't get to the point about like what we would change and what we had in those days that could be reproduced. But a point in your favor, a lot of the concepts, a lot of the thoughts of being creative and innovative did live in us. I will say this, it may be a self-serving statement. It lived in the TT firm, which is very innovative. It lived in my firm. And when I look at the things that I think about and about a job and what I want to do and everything else, it's like I want to make it better. I want to make it more innovative. I take simple buildings sometimes and I just play a game with myself just to see what I could do a little bit different in order to make it real. So the time and the experience that we had at that time have really created two rather Rather nice, rather almost, you know, famous structural firms, well, and that's unusual. Well, you know, and, and I just, um, I just like to say, I'm working with a lot of young engineers now that we see, and and truthfully, the tools that we're starting to have now that actually have brought collaboration back into the fold in the sense that we're not sitting in our corners with with 80, 100 drawings with the mechanical engineer and the architect in one corner. The tools that the younger engineers are coming in with now, where they can actually all work in the same model. I see, a group, I see a group of young engineers in their 20s and young architects who actually are looking at this challenge and I think they're going to do something. We may not know have the answer here, but I'm pretty confident from what I see that they're going to, they're going to change. Because they want to do. They want to, have, they want to do what you did and they want to do it in, in, this, uh, in this era. So, uh, and I think we'd like to help them also, to be candid with you. I'd love to see a return of that. I'd love to see young engineers involved because I have to tell so you. So we got to go shoot all the construction managers, what no, you're telling well, me. No, 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 <laughs> I think I think what that happened quickly, it happened because a lot of contractors were, were, were actually, uh, you know, they wanted to get into an involvement. They all started with this guy Carl Morse, Morse Diesel. He came in, he looked at a job, said, no, that's not good. I used to call him already fire aim call more so he never really like finished the whole thing but he created this thing of well you got that building it's that expensive from that contract i'll take it and i know that i can make it cheaper and that whole thing created i mean builders don't want to risk builders want to get a job out they don't want to play russian roulette opening the documents and finding out they can't afford what was designed so this thing was very very appealing and i think that you know to a large extent that has really created uh, a great schism in our industry with respect to architects, engineers, and contractors. All right, with that, I'm gonna have to cut it off, open it up to the audience here, and I think there's a mic, do you have a mic? Um, Jim, could you, that's this young, young lady here. Um, hi, uh, my name is Edai Nechi, and I'm currently working with Thornton Thomas City as a senior designer. And uh, when you made a comment about nowadays it is a good idea to get rid of um, uh, the um, construction manager and just do design with, I couldn't agree more. And currently I am uh, writing a uh, paper about integrated project delivery method, just in case if anyone, you know, some people don't have any idea about it. It is basically getting all the architects, uh, engineers, uh, uh, builders all together from the design uh, for in early design all together to you know put ideas and see if it is kind of uh, if if it can uh, be constructed uh, or if it has any problems from the beginning in early stages. So uh, my question is. Um, why it is not used in United States specifically? Uh, I um, I interviewed Mr. Michael Zetlin, uh, Mr. Son's uh, son, and um, he's a lawyer. He's a uh, basically um, a construction law lawyer. So he told me that he doesn't really recommend this project delivery method because it's too risky and uh, unless he knows all the unknowns. And I was wondering why, because like design build is like where you have all the innovation and then it is like really, um, you know, um, good delivery method to uh, basically save the money, all the mistakes and be more innovative. Why it is not recommended? So why, why IPD, we are all familiar. Why not IPD? I've actually had debates with Michael Zetlin about the, the contractual part of IPD, me, but why not IPD? Why not well, in New York? Me I mean, you see it in it, some it's parts not of the a country. question of New York or anything else. You're talking about a very complex issue, and I don't think it can be answered just that simply. 
P3 is really the way it's going in, uh, in public works. Do you know what that is? I presume you know what P3 is. Public-private partnerships, yeah. It, you know, it's design, build, plus. But uh, many st most states have it now. And most states uh, slowly are, are, and many, many projects are going that way. And there are all kinds of reasons why it's good in some cases and it's not good in others. That's true of design, build, and anything else. You would never go, I don't think, with the typical flat plate cookie cutter design built because it's, it's a simple deal. But, <clears throat> and, and those, the guys usually that build those things aren't interested in that sort of thing. It, it, there's so many factors, there's so many issues, it just can't be answered. I, I'd sit down with you one day and uh, be, I will get you to buy me lunch or on your browser with somebody <laughs> and I'll explain them because I'm retired, I don't want to buy lunches. <laughs> IPD, I believe, was invented on the West Coast by the West Coast AIA. It's an absolute right step in the right direction. Uh, is it the only solution? No. Design builds the same thing. EPC, Engineer Procure Construct, has been done in the petrochemical industry for decades. Okay. IPD is just eliminating, essentially, all the adversarial relationships, and that's what we've got to get rid of. No, I, to, to, to that point, I was, if anybody looks at the original IPD, nine principles of IPD, I would make the argument that any successful job where you define success as you get to the end of the job and you'd actually like to do it again with all the parties, follows all of those nine principles. There's things there like shared risk, shared reward, reward, early involvement of all players, using the latest technology, you know, all of those things, those are the principles. That's the principle of a successful job. I think where IPD went wrong, and especially in New York, was they, they tried to create a contract and said, here, Mr. Here Related, you'll sign this contract. The, the world's way too complicated to think that a contract developed by the AIA or anybody else is ever going to be signed by anyone. But the principles is exactly those, if you go through those principles, the world's fair was the IPD principles on steroids. All of those things that they went, there was nothing about adversarial. Everybody worked together. Everybody was, had, had skin in the game. Uh, and that's why I was successful. Can I make a suggestion? <coughs> Don't talk to your lawyer. <laughs> Charlie, how can uh, you not be safe? Uh, we have in the back right there. I don't have the drawings, but let me put it to you this way. Okay, the piles went in, they weren't treated, but there was even worse than that. Uh, the fact of the matter was they were driven to refusal instead of at 70 feet, they were driven to refusal at 36 feet. So the problem here is that the piles were never, ever long enough. Contrary to some comments that were made about going back and retapping, you found them. No, they were too short. They never, ever got to the level of refusal that the geotechnical engineer did. Zetlin, in turn, if 